I'm uh, Llewellyn Matthews. I'm the director of the Northwest Pulp and Paper Association. And I noticed he's very aggressive with the little <laughs> signal, so <laughs> I thought I would try to um, do my own part really, really quickly. Uh, we represent pulp and paper mills in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. So the quick part is 200 years of pulp and paper energy history in 20 seconds. So in the mid-1800s, the pulp mill was designed to be pretty much energy self-sufficient and sent power to the local community. Somewhere over the next 100 years or so, uh, the advent of big utilities, fancy things like environmental requirements that took energy, the mills were not so energy self-sufficient. Uh, we probably dropped to a low point in self-sufficiency by the 1970s, uh, maybe right around 50%. And since then, it's been a slow climb back. And hopefully, by the middle of this century, the 200 year mark, we'll be back to self sufficient and putting uh, energy back on the grid. Uh, we're very proud in the Northwest that we never dropped as low as 50%. Uh, we, we're right now around 80%. We have some mills that are in excess of 95% energy self sufficient. We do this primarily with biomass. Uh, we uh, believe that that's a clean, green, renewable fuel so long as we have a net sequestration in the forest in the Northwest. So that's a whole other political area for another topic of discussion. But now to a uh, point of view on carbon pricing, I think I'm here because I have a contrarian point of view, <laughs> and you always heard it before. Uh, we, uh, in the private sector, we're not utilities. Uh, the dollar figure that it takes to drive change on per ton of carbon uh, is, can be very large. But the, if you apply that same dollar to ton of carbon that we produce, it can be very, very tiny and put these mills at a competitive disadvantage relative to um, Asia, for example. Our margins are very, very thin. We cannot pass the price on to our consumers. So the, uh, we're, we're, we are not in favor of carbon pricing because for two reasons. We think it's a, a disincentive, a uh, perverse disincentive in a couple of ways. Um, during the 2000 session, a variety of schemes were uh, considered, and even at a very low level of uh, dollar per ton rate, started generating numbers off of our industry that first we noticed it was exceeding, for a lot of mills, the available capital that they had to invest in the year. And then as we got into the recession, uh, those numbers began to be more than the book value of some mills. One sold during that period of time for 30 million, and we were looking at price impacts in that range. So clearly something's out of whack. If you're an investor, an owner of a, of a manufacturing sector, looking at a tax equal to your book value or equal to some number that you relate to, like your capital improvement budget, you know where you're going with that. You're not, you're not staying around, you're not investing in the mill. Okay, so cap and trade didn't go forward at that time, but despite the recession, uh, my industry undertook a number of new projects uh, Nippon paper industry, 71 million for a new cogen boiler, produces 20 uh, megawatts of renewable power for the grid. Port Townsend, similarly, uh, 25 megawatt power. These were uh, permitted this year. Inland Empire paper the year before. Uh, it's a thermal mechanical bill with almost a complete rebuild, reducing its dependence on natural gas by 77%. That mill with one project met its 2050 goal. Uh, Longview Fiber, also 2010, a complex uh, modernization involving several uh, boiler rebuilds um, in a similar price range. Prior to that period of time, we had um, major rebuilds at uh, Kimberly Clark and out at um, Simpson Tacoma Craft. I can sit here before you today and say that at least the four projects and probably the two projects before that would never have been built had there been a carbon tice, carbon pricing scheme in place. The mills need these for, uh, to stay uh, modern, uh, and uh, frankly, uh, without that modernization and the replacement of these older boilers, it, 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 these mills can't stay competitive. Uh, the other, the other uh, second point that I wanted to make about perverse incentives, I see my number one, number one minute card up, is that where you have a, a mixed population age of boilers, the ones that I'm talking about tended to be from the 1930s, 1920s. They were kept current to a certain extent, but the projects I've talked about are replacements. What about a mill that has something newer? 
they are a possible candidate to hold out uh, long term for a more advanced technology that might just be in the research and development stage. If, um, if, you, if under a carbon pricing scheme, that takes away the incentive to wait for something that might be more advanced than the type of projects that I'm talking about today. It's, it's bleeding off capital. So in sum, um, the, we, we believe in our industry that energy efficiency should be the focus. Certainly for ourselves, we want to get back to being energy self-sufficient. That's not a, uh, it's not a articulated position, but you scratch the surface of any energy manager in the industry, and that's what they believe, is that we need to get back to self-sufficiency and hopefully producing power for the grid. And secondly, we're very concerned that any pricing system can tend to create a perverse incentive in the private manufacturing sector. So thank you.